Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 update for today, March the 5th. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Fitzgerald for a quick update. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Since the media advisory yesterday, we have one new confirmed case of COVID-19 in our province. This is in the Eastern Health Region, and the individual is between 40 and 49 and a contact of a previous case. The total number of cases in our province is now at that 1,003. There have been nine new recoveries in Eastern Health, leaving 113 active cases in our province. Seven people are in hospital due to COVID-19, and a total of 114,211 people have been tested to date. The continued low case counts we have seen this week are very encouraging, particularly given that they are the result of travel or contacts of other confirmed cases. While we remain optimistic, it is important for us to have confidence that the risk of community spread is reduced so that we can begin easing of restrictions both on and off the Avalon. To help us in this regard, Eastern Health will be offering voluntary testing to individuals who are not experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. We know that many individuals who test positive during this outbreak had no symptoms at all. So this surveillance will help us determine if there are any pockets of COVID-19 that have gone undetected. It will also help us in our decision to ease restrictions further. Testing centers in Mount Pearl, St. John's, Buren, Harbor Grace, and Clarenville are now accepting appointments for asymptomatic individuals who wish to receive a COVID-19 test. Additional mobile testing clinics will take place in Trapassi, Bonavista, Placentia, and downtown St. John's throughout the next week. If you wish to book an appointment, please complete the online assessment tool or by calling 811. When completing the online self-assessment tool for asymptomatic testing, please select both of the following options to receive an appointment. Select, I do not have symptoms, and select yes for the question, do you require COVID-19 test as a result of an advisory from public health? While I know that people take comfort in low case counts, I caution everyone not to let your guard down. We are simply not there yet. Everyone must continue to adhere to public health restrictions and recommendations according to your region of the province. Today, we have more good news on the vaccine front. We are announcing the first recipients of the AstraZeneca vaccine. The initial shipment will be offered to first responders and frontline essential workers. These individuals are critical to the protection of lives and safety in our communities, as well as essential to the societal functioning that has to persist regardless of the prevalence of COVID. AstraZeneca vaccine has been approved for those under 65 years of age, which aligns well with the demographics of these priority groups. We expect that vaccinations will, be will begin as soon as the first shipment arrives here. As well, Health Canada has approved another COVID-19 vaccine, this one manufactured by Janssen Incorporated. This adds another safe and effective option for provinces and territories. This is a one-dose vaccine approved for individuals over the age of 18 and can be stored at temperatures between two and eight degrees Celsius, which makes it easier for transportation. As the announcement was only made this morning by Health Canada, we do not yet have confirmation of the amounts or timelines for shipments of this vaccine for Newfoundland and Labrador. I am also pleased to report that we have almost 60,000 individuals pre-registered for a COVID vaccine in the 70 and older age group. This is a substantial proportion of that age category, nearly 80%, and I'm very encouraged to see so many people making the choice to be vaccinated. As I've said before, everyone in our province who can be vaccinated should be vaccinated. More people vaccinated means greater community protection against COVID-19. Better protection means hopefully a faster return to our normal lives in a fully functioning society. Starting today, both Western Health and Central Health will begin contacting those over the age of 85 who have pre-registered to book their appointment for vaccination. 
Please be patient. It might take a couple of weeks for your RHA to get to your community, but if you've pre-registered, you are in the queue. I would like to thank today the Newfoundland and Labrador Centre for Health Information. They are responsible for supporting our surveillance and reporting systems and have created new technology platforms such as the travel form, the COVID online assessment and referral tool, and our new vaccination registration system. While the staff of the centre are behind the scenes, they have played a critical role in helping us to respond quickly to this rapidly changing pandemic. As a recap, for those who may have just joined us, we have one new confirmed case since yesterday's media advisory, and the total number of cases in the province is now 1,003. Although we are making great strides, our work is far from over. Every decision we make is carefully considered based on risk assessment and closely monitored. Our provincial public health system has done its very best to protect our population and will continue to do so moving forward. Our ability to control this outbreak has only been possible because of the trust you have placed in us. We ask for your continued patience and commitment in the months ahead as we continue to navigate life with COVID-19. So hold fast Newfoundland and Labrador and thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. This has been our third week of lockdown on the Avalon, and in the last few days, we've seen our numbers move down <clears throat> to single digits and our recoveries move way up. Please keep in mind that we're not out of the woods just yet. You have to keep your guard up. The COVID variant has put us all where we are today, but our collective will and efforts is getting us right back out. People are following the health measures, and the numbers reflect that. Be optimistic. It's good for your mental and physical health. Month by month, as we move towards summer, things will get better. They are getting better. The federal government today announced the approval of Johnson & Johnson's single-dose vaccine. More vaccines mean more hope. We will have 80,000 people vaccinated by the end of the month. And our hope and our plan is that by the end of June, every Newfoundlander and Labradorian who wants to be vaccinated will be. It's important to know that as more and more people get vaccinated, they still need to abide by the public health measures and respect social distancing till further instructed. But again, this is a good news day and everyone in our province should feel a little bit better about the brighter months to come, excuse me. Before we get there, we all need to dig a little deeper and continue to follow those public health measures. Listen to the advice of Dr. Fitzgerald and her team, be vigilant, with, your, with our health measures. Be patient, and most importantly, be kind. It promises to be a great summer in Newfoundland and Labrador. Let's all keep working collectively towards that. I'll now turn it over to Minister Haggy for a brief update. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. Again, 113 active cases on uh, day 362 of these media briefings. Uh, we have AstraZeneca and uh, our doses uh, inbound. Uh, hopefully within the next week, and now Janssen have been approved uh, to a single-dose uh, vaccine of the same type uh, as AstraZeneca, but approved for anybody over the age of 18. Um, the registration for vaccines for over 70s continues with the last group of the alphabet uh, starting today. Uh, when that finishes on Sunday, uh, those um, uh, slots will open for anybody who may have missed their opportunity when their, their name came up. Um, I would encourage uh, everyone uh, to continue to do this online if possible, and for those who can't, for various reasons, there, there is the phone line. Um, we still, uh, even for those people who are vaccinated, do not know what effect, if any, um, a vaccine will have on people's ability to transmit the virus one to another. So the importance, as Dr. Fitzgerald said, is to is to hold on and continue to, to follow current public health guidance. In terms of the other uh, initiative announced around pop-up surveillance, uh, this will be a combination of the existing clinics um, in places like the Reed Centre, but also some mobile clinics. Um, and I just repeat what uh, Dr. Fitzgerald said, the best way to deal with this is 811healthline.ca and fill in the self-assessment form, filling in both, yes, I have no symptoms, 
and yes, this is the result of an advisory, and then you will be offered an appointment at one of the fixed or mobile clinics. Um, I think uh, this is a tribute, the position we find ourselves in to public health and Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, uh, and something of an example, I think, to other jurisdictions in Canada and around the world. Uh, we need to hold the line, and if we do so, then I think there is a very real prospect of a new summer for all of us. Uh, so with that, Premier, I'll hand it back to yourself. Well, thank you, uh, Minister Hagee. I'll now open it up to the media for questions. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, there are seven reporters registered for today's call. The question and answer session will be conducted in two rounds, where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. <clears throat> Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have one final question. Our first questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. Minister Hagee, I'm wondering if you could expand on that comment you just made that um, we're on track for a new summer. What do you think our summer will look like? Um, again, uh, optimism, uh, I think, is the order of today. Uh, I certainly recall last summer and the, uh, the staycation season started early. Uh, sorry, started late. I think uh, we may well be on track to start uh, on time this year. I think it's too early to say what will happen in terms of interprovincial travel because that's outside our, our control. Uh, but I really think that uh, by the end of summer, uh, there will be some serious consideration maybe of going back to alert level one, which we've never been to yet. Uh, but again, this is all speculative. We need to check on our surveillance and we need to have this trend, very optimistic as it is maintained, and roll out our vaccines. And the only thing that's holding us back with vaccine is vaccine supply. And with the announcement that the AstraZeneca vaccine is going to go to uh, frontline essential workers, including police and paramedics, I'm wondering, um, with 7,000 doses arriving in the next week or so, who are the essential workers? Because there's a lot of confusion, for example, people working in grocery stores wondering, you know, there isn't a list out. Am I going to be included as a frontline essential worker for these vaccines? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, certainly, um, you know, we've been um, reaching out to uh, some of our um, first responders right now. And, and certainly we know the number of first responders uh, that we have in the province is very similar to the number of vaccines that we're actually getting. So, um, you know, our, our first reach out will be there. And then as we, uh, as we move through and as we get more AstraZeneca, um, then we'll be offering it uh, to those who essentially have to go to work. Um, the people who had to go to work through alert level five and be in contact with the public. Um, so these are the, the, these are the groups we'll be targeting going forward. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you, um, Dr. Fitzgerald. With this announcement today that we're going to begin uh, voluntary testing of asymptomatic people, um, I was wondering if you could expand on the group that we're targeting here, uh, because of course asymptomatic people will cover a lot of ground. Um, are there any specific pockets of people you wish to target with this? Uh, so for example, maybe asymptomatic people who are on the front lines, um, is there any specific target group here? Uh, no, what we're trying to do right now is to get a snapshot for the population to see where, if anywhere, that COVID is. Um, so I would suggest to anybody, if uh, if you want to get tested, to certainly reach out. Uh, Eastern Health will be providing some of that information in a news release as well. So you can certainly check on their website um, and uh, to reach out and uh, get tested so we can see if you, it doesn't mean if you don't have symptoms, obviously if you have symptoms, you still do our online assessment and referral tool and uh, get your test done. But uh, we haven't uh, routinely had it open for people without symptoms. So um, this is just something new for us just to get an idea of what's out there. So I would encourage anybody to, uh, to come forward and get the testing done if they have concerns. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're on the front lines, yes, absolutely. Uh, please reach out get, and uh, fill out the form to get uh, an appointment. And this will be going on over the, the, the week, um, you know, the weekend and, and next week. So uh, there'll be time to get in there. Thank you. And um, in terms of the AstraZeneca, or sorry, the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson 
vaccine that was announced uh, to be approved. Um, this vaccine is different in that it's a single dose shot. Um, can you explain exactly what that means and how it's different from the other products that are out there like uh, Moderna and Pfizer? Um, so the Moderna and Pfizer, what we call mRNA vaccines, um, these, uh, the Janssen and AstraZeneca are both viral vector va vaccines. Um, Janssen has done its study with um, a one dose um, regimen for its um, for its vaccine, so and it found it to be quite effective. So um, that's why it's recommending a one dose uh, a one dose um, regimen for the uh, for the vaccine. Thank you. Our next questions are from Roger Bill with the Shoreline News. Please go ahead. Um, people who are registering for vaccination stage two, when when will the first vaccination uh, start to happen? Um, so for those over 70 um, who are registering, so the um, health authorities will be reaching out over the next week, Central, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> Central Health and uh, Western Health will be reaching out next uh, to book appointments starting next week for those over 85. And, and the appointments will likely be when, Dr. Fitzgerald, that's what I was wondering. Pardon me? The appointments, when will they likely be? That's what I was wondering. Not uh, when they're going to be booked. Yeah, the, so my understanding is that the appointments will be for next week. Oh, okay, I understand. Thank you. And how is the order decided? Who's first, second, and third? I, I would presume it's organized by geographical area and then ranked by age. And if that's the case, other people in phase two who aren't age specific, where do they get slotted in after the last of 70 plus people are vaccinated? So certainly we know that the greatest risk is age. Um, you know, and the and as we're o the older we are, the more at risk we are for for severe disease, and we certainly see a fairly sharp gradient after 70. So um, that's why we're offering it to, to this age group. So what uh, you know, certainly operationally, I, I um, wouldn't want to presume to um, uh, be able to comment on, on exactly how things are rolling out in the region. They're certainly the experts in that area, but. Uh, my understanding is that they'll be going into communities and they'll be offering the vaccine to those that are in um, in the appropriate age group. Uh, some communities, you know, that are more isolated, that may take a little bit uh, more to get to, and especially now that we've expand, extended the dose interval, um, you know, it may mean that they do more than just over 85. They may do over 75 uh, in some of those communities because they're there and, uh, you know, it just makes more sense logistically to do, um, you know, as many people in that age group as they, in the over 70 age group as they can while they're there rather than to have to go back two or three times. So it'll depend very much on their context. Our next questions are from Jason Piercy with Rogers Communications. Please go ahead. Hi, hello. Uh, there seems to be some misunderstanding about how vaccines actually work when it comes to preventing the contraction of a virus versus lessening the severity of the symptoms of the virus. I'm wondering if you can clarify that for us so that people don't misunderstand what they should be expecting after vaccination reaches the majority of our population that decides to take advantage of it. Yeah, so the way the vaccines work in general is that if you get exposed to, if you've been vaccinated and you get exposed to that virus, we'll say, for example, uh, <clears throat> going forward, then your body will mount the immune response necessary to prevent that virus from taking hold and causing, causing an infection. Uh, it doesn't mean that that virus can't get into your system. And in fact, it kind of has to get into your system in order for your body to be able to respond to it. So what it basically does is it, is it, uh, it has, your body has been primed to be able to deal with that virus um, so that once it sees it, it knows, oh, here's what I have to do. These are the antibodies that I need to be able to protect against it. So you never really develop the disease. So that's what we're talking about here. When we're looking at severe disease, um, they're looking at how many people uh, got really sick, ended up in hospital, ended up in ICU, or unfortunately may have died after receiving the vaccine. And that's what we're seeing protection against at this point. As we get more experience with this vaccine, um, you know, we may, we will uh, likely be able to get information about how does this vaccine uh, prevent spread from one person to another. So 
you know, if, if the, the measles vaccine, for example, you have two shots of that, it's highly effective vaccine. Um, if you have the measles vaccine and you get exposed to measles, then chances are you're not going to pass it on to anyone else because you won't develop the disease. Um, we know this is true for measles because we've had many, many years of experience with the me measles vaccine. Um, so we're just learning all of that with COVID right now. So that's why um, we can't answer those questions right away. And it wouldn't really be uh, responsible of us to try to say that it, it reduces uh, transmission when we just don't have the evidence. The expectation is that it will, just as many other vaccines have, but, but we need to have that evidence first. So having that said, is, is it entirely possible that someone who can be fully vaccinated um, and still contract and carry and possibly test positive, but just likely be much less likely to become severely ill? Yeah, theoretically that is possible. And certainly we know, you know, it takes a little bit of time for the body to respond to a vaccine to be able to produce those antibodies that are necessary. So uh, the first two weeks after getting the mRNA vaccines, for example, there have been people who have still gotten infected with the virus in that period of time. And that's not unexpected. Um, but uh, so yes, it is possible. Uh, and especially with the tests that we're using, they're very, very sensitive. It doesn't take a whole lot of, uh, of genetic material to give you a positive test. So, um, you know, theoretically it's possible, yes. I don't know how okay, probable it is, <laughs> but it's possible. <laughs> Our next questions are from Andrew Robinson with The Telegram. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, regarding the uh, Janssen Inc. or Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine uh, announced today, uh, I've seen it reported uh, we're likely to get 10 million doses uh, in nationally by September. Um, I mean, based, based on, I know, I know you suggested it's, it's too early to, to say exactly how much, how many doses uh, Newfoundland Labrador might get, but I mean, is, is there any sort of way to estimate based on what we've received so far of orders of other vaccines, you know, how, how much the province might, might expect in terms of a number or a percentage even? I don't think we just we just don't have that information no, right we now. we really don't at this point. It's just so new. We haven't even had those discussions at all, really. Good. Um, my second question, uh, following up on that, uh, if 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 this vaccine is a single dose one, and uh, say we're at a point, you know, towards the end of June where everyone has received the first dose of the vaccine, would the with the Janssen one as a single dose vaccine, would it still be able to serve the function as, you know, being that second dose necessary for people who've received the first dose of a two dose vaccine? Um, so um, we don't really have a whole lot of uh, information about the, um, you know, mixing and matching vaccines at this point. Um, there are some studies that are looking at that, but we don't really have any uh, definitive information really about how that should happen or if it should if it can happen or you know if it's beneficial for that to happen it's it's difficult to know at this point so um, I guess there really isn't an answer to that question uh, our goal is to uh, for two dose schedules is to complete uh, the two doses with the same vaccine thank you our next questions are from Michael Totten with the Canadian press please go ahead Good afternoon. Uh, what does 1.5 million additional nationally Pfizer vaccines mean for Newfoundland and Labrador? Sorry, I, I missed that. The question. The, the additional 1.5 million that the federal government announced of Pfizer. What that means? It's a per capita yeah, formula. Yeah, it's a per so. capita formula. So it'll mean. Uh, I don't even know what the percentage is right now, uh, uh, Premier. I don't know if you know off the top of your head. 1.8 1. 1. 1. percent times 1.5 million. Yeah. <clears throat> Carry the one. <laughs> oh, it, right, but uh, what 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 is it that you're? What does that mean? What is that it for the problem? How significant is that going to be? I, th I think that any time we get more doses of vaccine, it's uh, significant. It allows us to achieve the goal. So. Uh, we want uh, as much vaccine as we can possibly get, no different than uh, any other jurisdiction in the province, uh, in the country, sorry. Okay, and uh, my second question is, uh, Premier or the Minister of Health, um, what are your plans for treatment of people with long-term 
uh, symptom of COVID, sometimes called long haulers. Well, um, that's a more of a clinical question, I suppose. So probably three of us could answer that uh, to some extent. But I think it's safe to say that uh, you know we're that the system will be set up to provide whatever care that they need uh, in the short, medium, and long term. Uh, I know that there there has been reports, and we're still learning, of course, the long term effects and impacts of COVID-19. But uh, the department and our healthcare providers will be there uh, to provide whatever supports patient need, patients' needs as they develop and as they uh, emerge uh, on their recovery path and rehabilitation from uh, COVID-19. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. For those who are in a continuous state of self-isolation or those who return to the province to have self-isolate, can they still avail of this um, symptom-free testing? Um, certainly if people are, um, uh, have returned and are, um, so anyone who's self-isolating who would be a contact of a case, first of all, they would have had testing arranged for them. So I, I don't think that would be necessary. Um, if it's people who are traveling back into the country and they really want to get testing done, uh, then certainly they can reach out and, uh, you know, though there, there are processes in, in place already for those people because, if they develop symptoms, there's there's processes in place for them to get tested. So yes, they can reach out. Thank you. And now that we're opening up testing a bit more, is there any changes uh, for rotational workers? Are we looking to go back to the previous system we had in place, uh, allowing for testing on day five or seven, and then alleviating their self-isolation based on results? Um, so this testing right now is, is, is a short-term um, uh, not really project, but <laughs> yeah, we're just we're doing this just to inform our decision making in the next uh, week or so. Um, so it's not something that uh, we'll we'll be doing, you know, uh, ongoing uh, from this point onwards. I just want to make that clear. Um, but uh, uh, you know, we are looking at the the situation for rotational workers and how we need to approach that uh, in this. Uh, day and age of variants now and uh, and seeing those rise in many countries around the world as well as in in our own country um, so we're we're looking at that and hoping to have uh, uh, some further information about that in the coming days <clears throat> thank you our next questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC please go ahead uh, question why is central and western starting their vaccinations for people over 85 before other regions like eastern um i think some of it just has to do with numbers of people but eastern will be starting as well um uh, to the best of my knowledge um i'm just as of time that i came out here um i didn't have that information but uh uh, I believe they will be starting uh, in the very near future as well with, uh, with regard to uh, calling people over the age of 85. And my follow-up question is for Minister Haggy. Uh, with the cases that we're seeing dropping, why is the health system still cancelling routine medical procedures? Looking at other provinces like Ontario, they have continued even in lockdown to do many of those procedures, uh, even with higher rates of COVID hospitalization and higher daily case numbers. Yeah, good question, Peter. On the level five, um, the uh, elective, the planned procedures are, uh, are are off, and until we make a decision about that, I think that's a prudent risk management strategy. In terms of level four, this is very much down to the discretion of each individual regional health authority, uh, much more so. Uh, in terms of um, background activity or, or ongoing activity, maybe a better phrase, um, cancer-related surgeries, surgeries that are deemed urgent, diagnostic tests that are deemed urgent uh, or time-sensitive uh, have never been uh, halted. Um, uh, we never, for example, had to stop cancer chemotherapy or radiation treatment, such as Ontario has done in the past. So I think we're in a slightly different situation uh, as, um, as to uh, what will happen next. I think that really depends on the results of the pop-up surveillance on whether we can move to uh, to level three, for example, off the Avalon. And certainly that would free up a lot more um, capacity in the healthcare system to look at getting back onto the routine work of the healthcare system. 
Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, a week ago when the vaccination plan was announced, uh, it was said that government was still working out the kinks to ensure that people aren't skipping the line as it were to get their vaccine earlier. Um, do we have an update on what's being done to ensure that that doesn't happen? I think, Richard, you're referring to people like disclosing uh, their, their the honors is with an honor system based on their own medical conditions and such. Is that what you're referring? Yeah. To? So people who say wouldn't be in one of the identified uh, priority groups trying to register anyway and hope, hopefully getting their vaccine earlier. Um, so right now the pre-registration is open to those 70 and above, and uh, you know it, it, that's certainly something that's. Uh, quite easily uh, checked with an MCP. So, um, you know, I don't anticipate that there'll be many people jumping the queue in that situation. Yeah, my, my question is more so about like, do we have any uh, more protocols, like uh, I, I guess a more uh, concrete vetting process in place yet as we move towards the vaccination? Um, so, those are questions we're still uh, we're still looking at. You know, each group uh, that we look at is is quite different. Some of them are very difficult to capture, um, and uh, trying to find ways to do that um, um, while still maintaining efficiency and ease of use of these registration systems is uh, is uh, something that we're working through. So. Um, at this point, uh, that's, I guess, what, what, what I can say is that we are working through them. And as we um, anticipate going to uh, different groups, then we'll have uh, some of those um, things in place. But some of the groups, you know, we'll be just able to reach out to and, and that will be, um, it'll be us going to them and we won't need them to come in and register. Okay. And um, Dr. Fitzgerald, yesterday, the town of Deer Lake announced the use of the arena section of the Hodder Memorial Recreation Complex as a vaccination site for Phase 2. Um, would you recommend other municipalities look at similar facilities, and what guidance do you give now as towns and cities are uh, looking to navigate this process and prepare for the uh, vaccination program? So, um, you know, I would imagine that uh, any of these towns would be uh, in discussions with their regional health authorities as to uh, where vaccination clinics uh, could be held. So uh, I would uh, I, I would say I'd leave that to them for that discussion to make sure that uh, you know there's um, there's guidance in place. But the regional health authorities certainly would have that in hand. Thank you. Our next questions are from Roger Bill with the Shoreline News. Please go ahead. Um, I don't know if the question for Premier Fury or Dr. Hagee, but uh, I'm feeling like I'm missing something here. I'm, I'm trying to understand the math that gets us from 80,000 people being vaccinated at the end of this month, which I think is the number that Dr. Hagee used last Wednesday, to getting to the point where everybody wants to be vaccinated, is vaccinated by the end of June, which is Premier Fury's goal. So just bear with me. If we assume that the total number of people who want to be vaccinated is let's say 440,000, 80,000 are already vaccinated at the end of this month. That leaves 360,000. And then we have to vaccinate the rate of 120,000 a month to meet the goal of having everybody done by the end of June. Yet we're getting 6,000 doses in round numbers of Pfizer vaccine every week. The prime minister said uh, the number has gone from 6 million to 8 million this month uh, nationally that was just a few minutes ago in his remarks. So proportionally, that we use the same number. Our 6,000 goes to 8,000 every week. That's 32,000 a month. We don't know about Moderna. We don't know about AstraZeneca. J&J, &J, uh, Canadian Press announced today was going to be available in September. So where's the where, where's it going to come from between the 32,000 for those of the Pfizer and the 120,000 people who get vaccinated every month? What am I missing? Well, uh, you know, our estimates are uh, around, uh, you know, the, the number of people who will want and uh, want the vaccine or is, you know, our estimates probably about 379,000 people and our estimate based on the supply of vaccine and uh, what we've been led to believe will be accelerating uh, increased level of supply. 
uh, not including Johnson & Johnson, uh, will be around 376,000 uh, uh, doses. So there are some assumptions in that model, including you know a 2% wastage, uh, the fact that uh, 12, we, we think maybe 12% of people won't uh, want the vaccine. And of course, it's not approved for uh, people under the age of 16 to 18 at this point in time. So if you take all those out of the uh, the population, including uh, the number that have been uh, vaccinated to date. Uh, the math puts us pretty close, uh, given the vaccine supply uh, that we're anticipating. Okay, so the, the base number is 380, and we presume 80 at the end of this month, so we've got 300,000 a month for the next three months. That, that presumes a remarkably accelerated uh, uh, rate of uh, uh, vaccines arriving. I hope you're right. Uh, th that's that's what we've been uh, led to believe. That's our hope. That's our plan. That's what we're going to work towards, including uh, increasing numbers of AstraZeneca uh, in, into the mix. So, um, you know, this is uh, this is I th and changing the dosing schedule, right, is incredibly important because it allows us not to hold on to that second dose, which we had been doing in the past. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, as we said on Wednesday, that was a true game changer in how we could kind of manage uh, the vaccine distribution uh, and inoculation efforts uh, moving forward. But uh, these are the numbers that we're operating with unless there's a, a disruption in supply chain uh, that uh, we think that we can achieve that by the first dose uh, by the end of, of June. Thank you. Our next questions are from Jason Piercy with Rogers Communications. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm receiving questions from the public about patient who any time they're outside of self-isolation are at a pretty great risk just because of any number of medical conditions that they have, but then who are also kind of forced to travel three times a week or more for dialysis. So in such extreme cases as this, can we adopt the process to approve special exemptions when it comes to vaccination prioritization? Because these people are sort of damned if they do and damned if they don't. Um, so, so someone, I mean, I certainly don't want to make a broad sweeping, um, statement there, but I mean, there are a significant number of these, uh, uh, patients who have been identified as being part of phase two and the rollout in phase two. So they will be getting the vaccine in the, in the near future. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, uh, we've got a fairly extensive list of those, um, people and certainly people on dialysis would be in that group. So, so anybody who's home worrying about it and stressing out about it, what do they go to a website? What call do they make? Do they expect to be reached out to? Like, I'm just trying to quell some of the anxiety that these people are suffering from. So certainly uh, those details will have to be worked out and we're in the process of trying to work through those now. So, um, you know, we do ask for people's patience, but for people to know that they are, um, you know, they are on the list. So we will be getting to them. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Our next questions are from Andrew Robinson with The Telegram. Please go ahead. Um, for people who are receiving uh, their first dose of the vaccine, of the vaccine now, do they have a choice in what vaccine they can receive, or are they pretty much at this point, they have to take what is offered to them at the time of their appointment? Um, so everybody has a choice uh, if they want to receive a certain vaccine or not, and that's true for any vaccine. Um, we hope that people will choose to take uh, the vaccine that's offered to them. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, at this point, we know that we can't offer the vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine to people over 65 and over. And so um, mRNA vaccines will be what's offered to them. Um, and, um, you know, but all these vaccines are safe and effective and will reduce the risk of severe disease uh, significantly. So we all, we have to remember that, that these are all effective vaccines. And you may have may have answered. But I was going to ask Nestle next with what, with what you kind of said then. But I mean, what would you say to people who you know, might be looking at you know these uh, you know different effectiveness rates that are thrown around for for various vaccines and saying, oh, I, I feel like I should I should want this one over over another, say. So I think yeah, it's the same message. All these vaccines have been proven to be safe and effective, 
And, um, you know, we need to remember that the protection we're getting is better than the protection that you have without one. And, um, and we need to um, get as many people vaccinated as possible so that we can reduce the risk, hopefully reduce the risk of spread of this, uh, this virus. So um, at this point, anyone, if you're offered a vaccine, you should take the vaccine. Thank you. Our next questions are from Michael Tutton with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Uh, can you just uh, tell me the number, total number of AstraZeneca uh, vac vaccine doses you have and when it begins again? Um, so we, the AstraZeneca won't be um, coming, I think, next week is when, is when we're expecting uh, some doses. There are, the, the doses have arrived in Canada, but they haven't been distributed to the provinces uh, as of yet. And um, can you just uh, explain why you decided to go down the path of choosing first responders rather than Nova Scotia's path of first come, first serve they're speaking of? Um, so we have a priority listing and uh, we feel that it is important. We developed that priority list of who we felt it was important to get the vaccine in the um, in the face of, of limited vaccine supply. And so that priority list stands regardless of what vaccine we have. So, um, you know, I think there are some groups that unfor unfortunately we're not able to offer the AstraZeneca vaccine to, um, but uh, you know, for those that, that we can offer to, we, we would like to work through our priority groups and get those people vaccinated. We've said it's important for them to be vaccinated and it's still important for them to be vaccinated. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, knowing that many people are gonna be able to get their first dose of vaccine um, on a premier comments by the end of June here, what does that mean for normal for us, for life for us, knowing that one dose doesn't necessarily cut down on transmission because we don't have enough evidence on it. Um, but for those who are looking on the optimistic side and that, you know, it's a step closer to normal, but how much closer is it really for us? Um, so that's a really good question. The million dollar question, Kellyanne. Um, and I wish I had an answer for you, but I mean, what, what we know about vaccines, I mean, the very fact if we can have as many people who want to be protected or 88 percent of our population protected uh, against severe disease well that says okay even if if this virus gets out there uh, you know people aren't going to get severely ill with it that protects our hospital capacity our healthcare system capacity uh, it improves um, uh, you know hopefully um, people uh, becoming quite ill with it so uh, that's important even if it doesn't uh, do anything with transmission that's still really important right so we have to remember that I hope that we'll have more data by the time June comes I hope that we'll have uh, more information and more evidence about how it affects transmission um, you know I think that's that's ongoing that collection is happening <clears throat> certainly in uh, some of our in the country's bigger jurisdictions um, they're seeing some, um, certainly some benefits to having, um, you know, congregate living settings um, vaccinated. And, and I think, um, I, 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 you know, the expectation is that we will see a positive effect on transmission because that's generally how vaccines work and what they'll do. But, um, you know, as I said before, until that evidence is there, it, we, we, we can't really say for sure that it is, right? Or that it will. I mean, Thanks. And Minister Hagee, you noted in the briefing earlier this week that the system right now isn't even at 50% on capacity in terms of staff needed to vaccinate. Based on the information we're seeing here now and the amount of vaccine that's going to be coming to the province and available to those, are we beginning to reach out to other agencies to help us in administering this, looking to pharmacists like we did um, through our flu vaccine campaign? Currently, we have uh, been in discussions with both pharmacists and physicians, as far as I'm aware, through conversations with staff. Um, our, um, our estimates through the regional health authorities suggest that we would manage between 120 and 160,000 doses a month 
through public health alone without being uh, overly challenged. So uh, um, we have a uh, first line, uh, we have a second line, uh, and uh, we also have micro-credentialing if we found ourselves in the situation where we get the backlog of vaccine from February that we're expecting. Uh, we have factored that into our calculations. Pfizer and Moderna have said over four to two that they would make this up. Uh, so that's where a lot of the dosage numbers that we've been using for planning come from. Uh, and um, I, I don't see capacity as a problem. And certainly we're perfectly prepared to discuss uh, administration of vaccine with any group that has the skill set to do it if it's outside the, the pharmacists and physicians who we have lined up. Thank you. I'll now go back through each reporter to see if you have one final question. Peter Cowan with CBC, do you have a final question? I do, yes. Uh, it was just a week ago that we were looking at the timetable of when people will start to become vaccinated with the two new uh, vaccines online and the change to the single dose. Uh, when will people who are not part of the priority group, that phase three, when will we start being giving first vaccination? Um, so certainly that depends on how quickly we can get through those phase two people and how quickly we get our vaccine and if those uh, shipments stay on schedule as we expect them to. Um, but, uh, you know, it'll it'll be likely um, into May really before we can start thinking about that. Richard Duggan with BOCM. Do you have a final question? Yes. Um, we had a call to our newsroom from someone who said he falls under... Uh, phase two for COVID-19 vaccinations, but tells us he was denied for receiving a vaccine at this time. Um, other than not actually being uh, in an identified priority group, un under what circumstances would someone be denied for getting a vaccine at this time? Um, so right now we're working through our priority groups and, and the priority group we've recognized that we had to focus on at this point is, is uh, those, are those over, se <clears throat> excuse me, over 70. So that's who we will be focusing on at this point. Um, so if somebody was not in that priority group, then I think they would have would be informed that, that you know, while they might be in a phase two priority group, that's just not the priority group we're focusing on at this point. We know that the greatest risk for severe disease is increased age, and that's why we're focusing here. Thank you. Roger Bill with the Shoreline News. Do you have a final question? Yes, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, I'd like to ask you to go back to um, uh, the unplanned, the urgent Friday night <clears throat> briefing uh, a couple of weeks ago when the Mount Pearl cluster uh, kind of erupted. At, at that time, you said, this is the big one. This is the big one. I'm curious, thinking now that we're at one case, what, what would you have thought the odds would have been three weeks ago that we would have got to the point where there's only one new case in a day? Um... <laughs> I don't know if I knew what to expect at that point, to be honest with you. We were dealing with a variant that we hadn't seen before. We were dealing with spread like we'd never seen before. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we all believe that if we had went, if we went hard and, and quick with those, uh, with the lockdowns and, and restrictions that we would, uh, we would see better control. But, uh, you know, I mean, this is hats off to uh, staff at Eastern Health. Uh, who have done an amazing job at tracking down contacts and getting people to isolate, getting people tested, literally thousands and thousands of contacts. Um, so, you know, my hat's off to them because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And, and that's the truth of it. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, that people have listened. And I think, I think this certainly uh, scared people to see 100 cases in a day, I think was a, uh, was a scary point for people, and, and I think people really took it seriously. So I'm really happy and grateful for that, um, because all of that helped to get us to where we are. But, you know, I don't know if any of us really knew what to expect or what to foresee at that point. Jason Piercy with Rogers Communication. Do you have a final question? Yes, I do, please. Um, I'm wondering if there are other illnesses that typically we monitor the prevalence of that we're seeing a significant decline in since these measures have come into effect nearly a year ago, like perhaps the influenza or, or maybe a few, let's call them more intimate infections. Like are we seeing declines 
in other things that we typically keep an eye on? Um, we certainly have seen a decline in influenza over this year. Uh, I, I don't, I can't tell you the definite numbers, but I think we've only had one case. It's just one. Yeah, right? I think we've only had one case this this year, uh, unless we've had more since then. But um, and that would be just one case that was tested. So um, there could be more out there than that. But um, yeah, so we've been seeing a decline in a lot of the respiratory diseases um, that we've had. Uh, um, that we normally would see over this uh, period of time. But, you know, these measures that we put in place um, that work for COVID also work for all of those respiratory diseases. Uh, with regard to sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, um, they, um, we did see a decline in some um, of the uh, but it's difficult to know if, if it's a true decline or is it just because people weren't able or didn't uh, decided not to get tested because of uh, restrictions and, and things like that. So um, it's really, really can't read in deeply because uh, we really need to dig into what the reasonings were behind that. Jason, just anecdotally, um, and I think it's a good reminder to people at home, uh, we, I have heard of increasing number of sliding accidents amongst kids. And so if your children are out there sliding, uh, please ensure that they have uh, safety equipment with them, including helmets. I know that people don't always think of helmets when it comes uh, to sliding, but um, I know kids are out and enjoying the outdoors and being healthy, and that's great. Uh, but uh, please uh, ensure that your kids have the right uh, safety equipment when they are outside uh, having fun. Well, at least the flu is down, so take that, anti-maskers. <laughs> Andrew Robinson with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? Um, sure. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald, we've, uh, I don't know, we've heard anecdotally at least that the, uh, that the process of, of giving a COVID vaccination can be a bit more time-consuming than perhaps you know, receiving the typical flu shot. I was wondering if you could just offer an idea of uh, you know, the perhaps compare the process of uh, flu vaccination versus COVID? Um, so they're both actually very similar. Um, there is a slight difference to how uh, the, f the COVID vaccine has to be given uh, in that um, uh, it just has to do with how you draw um, or you, how you inject air into the, into the vial before you pull it out. But um, so technically, there's a few uh, small differences there, but I, I, I don't think it's, uh, I haven't done a lot of injections, just a couple at the very beginning. So um, I don't think that there's, uh, there's much of a difference with that. I think it's just the setup of the, of the clinics because of the measures we've had to put in place because of COVID uh, makes a difference to uh, how we have to administer the vaccine, right? So we have to make sure there's physical distancing, there's appointment-based, whereas with, with influenza, traditionally, we would just, uh, it would be drop-in and it wouldn't be appointment-based. So um, that part of it has uh, perhaps slowed things down a little bit and we can't get as many through in a clinic as we normally would have because of those restrictions. Um, but the process of giving the vaccine um, the nurses right now who are doing that are quite adept at it, and uh, they, uh, uh, I don't think anything can slow them down, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Michael Tutton with the Canadian Press. Do you have a final question? Premier, um, or Mr. Furry, uh, one year is approaching, uh, and uh, my question is <laughs> the mental health of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Um, some people have described to me this as being like a, a public health disaster masquerading as a success for the whole region. Uh, not my words, words of psychologists at several universities. Um, what do you intend for going forward to help repair the mental health of your people? Well, I think this is something that every jurisdiction around the world is, uh, is uh, trying to uh, face and face head on. Uh, there's no question that uh, mental health uh, and addictions uh, have suffered uh, during a pandemic and a lockdown. And uh, our government uh, will be there. Uh, the people of Newfoundland and Labrador's government, I'm sure, will be there uh, to support uh, mental health and addictions moving forward. We recognize that this is uh, hard times. There's anxiety-provoking times. It's stressful times. 
um, being locked up, uh, considering employment, looking after children, loved ones, being isolated. Uh, this all I- impacts uh, people's uh, mental health, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, we have uh, provided resources online for people, and, but we know that that's not enough. Um, we've always been committed to advancing mental health and addictions care within the province, and we'll continue to do so at an accelerated rate now as we emerge from uh, from this pandemic to ensure that we have a healthy population physically and mentally. Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Do you have a final question? Yes, thank you. Mr. Haggy, you noted that by March 5th or end of day that uh, healthcare workers identified priority one would have received their first dose of vaccine. I'm just wondering if that's still the case, if they will receive it by end of day today. I would have to go back and uh, verify that, but I've not heard that they haven't. Some of our reconciliation processes in the smaller communities are actually paper-based, which is one of the reasons there's always that lag between doses arriving and doses being delivered. Uh, but uh, I've got to go back and check, and I'll try and have an answer for you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Premier, do you have any final comments for today? Thank you, everyone, for joining. Just a reminder again that if you are eligible for this round of vaccinations, please make sure you register. Also a reminder to please support your local businesses if you're able to. Uh, Many are offering online shopping, yoga, gym classes, as well as uh, curbside or takeout delivery. So please uh, support a local business when you can. Uh, Look after yourselves and each other and uh, stay safe.